Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining today's joint Columbia University Committee of 100 survey data launch, the state of Chinese Americans. And now please allow me to introduce Gary Locke, chair of Committee 100, former US ambassador to China and president of Bellevue College. Hi, I'm Gary Locke, chair of the Committee of 100 and welcome to this virtual gathering as we unveil the state of Chinese Americans a landmark data collection project spearheaded by Columbia University and Committee of 100. This project is a major part of Committee of 100's long-term efforts to develop actionable insights into the needs of the sprawling and diverse Chinese American community here in the United States today. We've gathered over 6,500 responses from across 46 of our 50 states, and thanks to dozens of community organizations that have helped distribute this survey. The findings shed light on the economic, political, socioeconomic, and demographic issues affecting our community, and will go a long way toward informing policymakers and members of the public about both our needs and our experiences. I'd like to take a moment to thank the nationally renowned leaders and researchers from Columbia University who will be speaking on the results of this groundbreaking survey. Dr. Melissa Berg, the Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work, and Dr. Jin Gao, who will be presenting the key findings. And of course, we'll hear from President of Committee of 100, Zi Wang, who has brought new energy and visibility to Committee of 100 over the past three years, and who worked very closely with Columbia University on this survey. After their opening comments and presentations, we'll briefly hear what we should take away from the data with an esteemed panel led by Gordon Chang from Stanford University. And joining Gordon will be a Dr. Neil Ruiz from the Pew Research Center, Wayne Ho from the Chinese American Planning Council, and Dr. Robert Santos from the U.S. Census Bureau. To all of our speakers and presenters, thank you for sharing your time and wisdom with us today. And I'm looking forward to a very informative and very lively session. So thank you all for joining us on this virtual unveiling. Thank you, Gary. Wonderful comments. Now, Please allow me to introduce Dr. Melissa D. Begg, Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work at Columbia University. Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Begg, and I have the great honor of serving as Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. The goal of social work is to maximize human well being and ensure that all can reach their full potential, no matter their life circumstances. Our mission as a school dovetails beautifully with what Columbia University refers to as our fourth purpose, which is to advance human welfare and bring about meaningful change by merging our distinctive intellectual capacities with groups and organizations beyond the academy, like the Committee of 100. Today, you will learn about the findings of a cutting edge research project launched barely one year ago that looks specifically at the demographic, economic, health and socio-political conditions of today's Chinese American population, a population that has too often been pushed to the margins for far too long. The State of Chinese American Survey will deepen our understanding of the many factors that influence the well-being of Chinese Americans today, which I am certain will shed light on many policies and practices that result in barriers to opportunity, experiences of discrimination, and increased risk of mental distress in this oft overlooked and understudied population. In social work, our engagement with research and clinical practice gives us deep insights into the causes of human suffering. And the fact that much of human suffering is actually caused by our own policies, but if we created those policies, then we can fix them. This critically important study will provide findings that make it possible for us to create clear and evidence-based policies policies that will lead to greater equity. I'm very proud that this project is led by my wonderful colleague, Dr. Qin Gao, a senior professor of social work at Columbia, who also serves as director of the China Center for Social Policy, the first center of its kind founded within a U.S. School of Social Work. The China Center for Social Policy pursues a dual mission of research and education. Through rigorous scholarship, the center contributes to social policy research and debates in China, and around the world. Through global communication and collaboration, the center serves as a platform for international dialogue and knowledge advancement. And finally, through training and career development opportunities, the center prepares the next generation of social welfare scholars and practitioners. In our 125th year as a school and as a profession, research like this is essential 
If we are to succeed in our goal to identify and promote the most effective ways to ensure that all individuals are able not simply to survive, but to thrive. And it is one of the many ways we can measure our success in executing on our fourth purpose. I want to thank Dr. Gao and the entire research team for their outstanding efforts. I also want to thank the Committee of 100, led by former Ambassador Gary Locke, a dedicated and longtime public servant. Since 1990, this group has been at the forefront of building a strong foundation of support to maximize the well-being of more than 5 million Chinese Americans in the United States. We at Columbia are enormously grateful for your partnership on this project, which is yet another example of your commitment. Thank you, Dr. Begg. And now, please allow me to introduce Committee of 100's President, Zing Wang, to talk briefly about why this research is important to the Chinese American community. Thank you all for attending this long-awaited event. The state of Chinese Americans represents the culmination of Columbia University and the Committee of 100's collective efforts. Alongside our more than 100 partner organizations to better understand the unique experiences and aspirations of the Chinese American community. By working alongside our incredible community partners, we believe we have innovated a cost effective and scalable methodology for data disaggregation. Data disaggregation is key to highlighting the nuances within the AAPI community and across other ethnic communities without which we cannot accurately speak to decision makers in government and policy. Of course, no single data collection project, no matter how sophisticated, is perfect. We recognize that this survey is not fully randomized and therefore cannot be fully representative of every single experience of every American of Chinese descent. Yet, by applying proven best practices in scientific methodology, we can still illuminate key findings about our community as a whole. Findings that will go a long way towards shaping social and political policy in this country for the greater good. And we should be justly proud to have made history with the single largest and most ambitious survey project ever conducted on behalf of the Chinese American community. A true testament to teamwork. This joint survey would not have been possible without a community. I would like to thank our advisory panel whose knowledge and expertise across the fields of academia and civic engagement serve to guide the project's development and implementation. They include Gordon Chang, Albert Chow, Anson Chow, Ella Chang, Deborah Davis, Wang Fen, Kenneth Fong, Erwin Garfinkel, Eugenia Lin, David Lei, and Ida Liu. I also want to thank Kenson Ventures LLC and City Private Bank as the two lead sponsors on this research. Lastly, and most importantly, I would like to thank the over 100 partner organizations in both the AAPI and non-AAPI communities who helped us distribute the survey across the United States. I wish I could name everyone in my remarks, but it might take up the entire schedule. That's how incredible you are. A full list of each partner organization can be found in our press announcement. But if I can just very quickly cite the type of organizations and people that came together for this like the Carter Center, the China Project, Chinese American Citizens Alliance, David Lay and Friends, George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations, Museum of Chinese in America, OCA, the United States Heartland China Association, to name just a few of the over 100 partner organizations. We are so grateful for these amazing organizations and individuals, without whom a project of this scale would simply never have been possible. We believe strongly that this survey represents not only a turning point in our ability to tell the Chinese American story better, but proof in the pudding of what we can accomplish as a community when we come together as one. Thank you. Thank you, Z. Inspiring comments indeed. And now I have the honor of introducing Dr. Jing Gao, Professor of Social Policy and Social Work, Associate Dean for Doctoral Education, Director of the China Center for Social Policy in Columbia University. Dr. Gao will now walk our audience through the research findings from Columbia University and Committee of 100. Dr. Gao, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And good evening, friends, colleagues, and community members. My name is Qing Gao. It's my great honor and pleasure to share with you very new 
uh, findings from our survey of Chinese Americans that was launched the last year in collaboration of the Committee of 100. As a Chinese American scholar, I feel it's not only my honor, but also my responsibility to undertake this important research project. I want to showcase uh, who we are as a community, what our contributions have been to the American society and what our needs are um, because they need to be met. I present on behalf of my amazing research team, my excellent co-authors, Jen So and Stacy Tao, who are both doctoral students at Columbia University School of Social Work, and Sam Collett, a researcher at the Committee of 100. We also want to thank many of our research team members, research assistants, advisory group members, and other collaborators and community partners who helped us and invested so much energy into this project throughout the past year. And last, but most important, we want to thank our study participants. Your energy, your time, uh, your uh, devotion to help us to complete this project really is what made it possible. With your input, we are able to tell the world our story. So thank you very much. I know some of you are in the audience today. Thank you. With that, please let me share our findings with you. So the title of my presentation is The Fight for Representation, The State of Chinese Americans, 2022. Let me begin with this graph. It shows the size of the Chinese American population, both in numbers and as a percentage of the total US population. The blue bars show the actual size, number of Chinese Americans in this country. We see that the bars were flat for a long time, then started to climb very rapidly, reaching about 5.5 million uh, in 2021, which accounts for about 1.7% of the total US population. The yellow line shows the percent of the people of Chinese descent in the US as a percentage of the total US population. It's very clear, this very unfortunate Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 led to an immediate decline in the percentage of Chinese American population in the country. It's thanks to the repeal of this law in 1943, exactly 80 years ago, that started to help us see a growth of the Chinese American population and later very rapidly. So the laws and policies do matter. We started this state of Chinese American survey with the vision to serve as the primary source of updated, comprehensive and accurate data about this population across regions and across diverse demographic and socioeconomic subgroups. Our mission is to use the data to inform policymakers and the public and help develop timely and responsive policies, programs and services. Our methodology is that we use the self-administered online survey available in English, traditional Chinese, and simplified Chinese to increase the language accessibility to our community. We designed a survey questionnaire, including 77 questions across six different topic modules. It's a non-probability sample recruited through the many over 100 partner organizations, some of whose representatives are in the audience today. Thank you. Our final sample size is close to 6,500 study participants. Then we, after the data collection, we used statistical weights, um, which is a method called post-stratification ranking method so that when the weights are applied, our weighted sample matches the population distribution on these key, key demographic variables, gender, age, education, English proficiency, citizenship status, income level, and region. So even though the sample is not nationally representative, it reflects the diverse experiences and views of the Chinese American population. Our sample uh, with, has half, 49% from the West region, followed by 26% from the Northeast, 16% from the South, and 9% from the Midwest. Our sample tells a story of growing up in America 
So on the left side on this slide, we show the place of birth that 52% of the sample reported that they were born in mainland China, followed by 27% born in the US, 8% in Hong Kong, 6% in Taiwan, and 7% in other places around the world. On the right side, you see the place of upbringing. We ask people, where were you living uh, when you were at age 12? We thought, consider that as the place of upbringing. And we, people said 44% were brought up in mainland China compared to 52% who were born in China. The percentage of those who were brought up in the US, 41% is higher than those who were born in the US, 27%. On this next chart, we show that the Chinese American population is a multilingual population. It shows the language spoken at home. So nearly half spoke English. That includes speaking English only, 24%. English in combination with another language, Mandarin, 12%. Cantonese, 9%. Both Mandarin and Cantonese, 3%. We also show that nearly 40% of our population spoke two or more languages, very multilingual. On the right side, you see 20% saying they speak Mandarin only at home, 18% Cantonese only, and 2% Chinese regional dialects only. 80% said they were English proficient. So 57% said they speak English well, and 22% speaking English well. Next, I'm going to show, share with you three main findings from our study. Finding number one, Chinese Americans feel they are accepted in American society, but they also experience high levels of discrimination. This graph shows people's ratings of how they feel they are accepted in American society, Asian American society, and Chinese American society. The top bar shows that 77% felt they are accepted in American society. Higher percentages, 88 and 90% said they feel accepted in Asian American and Chinese American societies. This graph shows the sense of cultural blendedness, how people navigate between American and Chinese cultures. The top bar uh, shows that 87% felt they were part of a combined culture, which as researchers, we refer to as cultural blendedness. The middle bar shows 81% felt they were someone moving between two cultures, which we refer to as cultural harmony. However, navigating two, two cultures isn't always easy. In the final bar, we show that 58% felt conflicted between the American and Chinese ways of doing things, what we refer to as cultural conflict. On the other hand, 42% felt they didn't have such a conflict. Despite the high level of feeling of acceptance and cultural blendedness, a lot of our community members have experienced racial discrimination in different forms. So this graph shows four bars. The first bar shows that 27% experienced bias or hate incidents in the past 12 months. The next bar shows that over half, 51% experienced everyday discrimination in their daily lives. Then more troubling, 64%, close to two in three people, said they experienced racism-related vigilance. When we combine these three bars, the final bar shows that 74%, three quarters of Chinese Americans experienced at least one form of this racial discrimination or vigilance. Next, we will delve a little bit deeper into this. So this graph shows the different kinds of bias and hate incidents people experienced. The first bar shows that 7% reported that other people vandalized or damaged their home, car, or other property. 9% said people physically intimated them uh, or assaulted them. Next, we see that 20% said people made a racial slur, called them a name, or harassed them either in person or online. Again, when we combine these three bars, the last bar shows that 
27% over a quarter experienced at least one form of this hate and bias incidents. This next graph shows everyday discrimination people experienced in daily lives. The first bar shows that 11% of people say that other people acted as if they were afraid of them. 26% said they were treated unfairly at restaurants or stores. 46% said they felt they were treated with less respect than other people. Combined over half, 51% experienced at least one form of these everyday discrimination experiences. Lastly, it's not only what people really experience, it's also the worries, the concerns, and the mental burden these po put on people's minds. So the majority of Chinese Americans worried about safety and kept vigilant in the past 12 months. The first bar shows that 37% felt unease in public areas or worried about how other people might look at them. 38% tried to avoid certain situations or places because they were worried about racial discrimination. And 55% worried about their own or their family's safety from a hate crime or harassment. Combined together, about two in three people experienced some of these racial racism-related vigilance in the past 12 months. Our community members are speaking up and taking action. Here are a few quotes we gathered from our study participants. First, someone said, I have not experienced anything personally, but remain very actively engaged with policies and funding that combat the rise of anti-Asian hate. Another person said, we do patronize Asian businesses in Chinatown and elsewhere where hate crimes have occurred. And lastly, another person said, I've attended many Asian rallies in San Francisco, San Jose, and actively follow social media in tracking attacks and incidents. This is finding number one. The next finding we want to share with you is Chinese Americans are active political participants. They vote, they care deeply about the issues facing the US society, and they want a better relationship between the US and China. This graph shows that Chinese Americans have high rates of political participation. On the left side, we limit the sample into Chinese American citizens only and look at their voter registration status. An overwhelming majority, 83%, were registered to vote. Only 8% were eligible but not registered. The 7% who didn't respond to this question may or may not be registered. But the message is clear. 83%, an overwhelming majority, are registered voters. Among these registered voters, 91% showed up to participate in the 2020 presidential election. So the turnout is very high. We asked the people, what are the most pressing issues facing the US today? And they share their opinions. The top rated issue, racism. Not surprising after we, what we just saw. Followed by gun control, the economy, crime. And the next batch of issues facing the US, according to our study participants, are income inequality, government or political issues, and the environment, climate change. Most of our study participants have high anxiety about the US-China relations today. On this graph, we see that on the left side, we ask people what are their opinions about US-China relations, ranging from very negative to very positive. 40%, the blue portion, said it's very negative. 49% said it's somewhat negative. If we combine those two portions, close to 90% of Chinese Americans think today's US-China relations is worrisome. On the right side, we rank these groups by education level from less than high school all the way to more than bachelor's degree. We see a clear pattern. The more education people have, the more worried they are. So among the less than high school group, Combined, 75% think US-China relations is very negative or somewhat negative. Among the higher, highest educated group, it's 95%.
the study participants also overwhelmingly think the two countries should collaborate and work together. And then we ask them, what are the top areas for mutual benefit that the two countries can work together on? The economy and the trade, the top choice, 25% people chose this option, followed by technology and science innovation, the environment, climate change, and global security. Lastly, we asked the people to describe in words how the tensions in US-China relations have impacted their daily lives. And this is the word cloud we cut from their descriptions. First, people are people. They care about the people in their lives and their daily lives, their community members. So we see very large people, family, community, friends. The, the size of these words reflect the frequency of, the, of these words being mentioned. Following these words, we also see a batch that's concerning media, hate, negative, um, some related to uh, what we talked about, racism. And lastly, there were also mentions about government, Taiwan, and Hong Kong related issues. Our key finding number three is this. Chinese Americans are not homogeneous. We know this, but with the data, we can show the world that we are not homogeneous. While often stereotyped as a model minority, many of our community face disadvantages, hardships in both health and economics, and may need support from policies and services. This graph shows the wide household income distribution among this population. If you look at the first bar, 10% of the Chinese American families had income, annual household income, less than 15,000 in the last year. This graph shows the portion of Chinese Americans receiving some form of assistance. And the very bottom, the bar shows that close to a quarter, 23% received some form of assistance. And the most common type of assistance is public assistance at the very top, 11% followed by other types, work-related private assistance or a combination of this assist assistance at the bottom 4%. What about disability? Something that we don't ask people a lot about. So this graph shows from the bottom bar, almost one in 10, 9% of the Chinese American population had one or more disabilities. That includes from the top 4% with physical disability only, 2% developmental disability only, 1% mental disability only, and 1% more than one type of these disabilities. We also want to point out 4% of people refuse to answer this question, possibly an indicator of the stigma associated with revealing one's disability status among the Chinese American community. We also want to look at different kinds of health disadvantage. So on this slide, the first bar shows what we just saw, 9% had one or more disabilities. The next bar showed in combination, 14% said they had either poor 2% or fair 12% physical health. And similarly, 14% said they had poor or fair mental health. If we combine these first three bars, in total, 24% or nearly a quarter had at least one form of these health disadvantages. We also asked the people about their subjective well being. We used two measures. The top bar is about psychological distress or the risk for mental illness. The blue portion shows that 8% had severe risk of mental illness, 16%, the yellow portion, had moderate risks. And the red part, 76% had low risk of mental illness. And the bottom, this bar is about life satisfaction. Overall, how do people consider their lives? 4% had low life satisfaction, followed by 25% who had moderate life satisfaction. So put together, this graph shows a quarter or more had either severe to moderate psychological distress or low to moderate life satisfaction. Lastly, we want to also look at different kinds of disadvantages or hardships. So this graph shows that from bottom bar, 23%, nearly a quarter, faced some form of medical disadvantage or economic hardship. 
from the top, we see that 3% had no health insurance or didn't know if they had health insurance. 5% had difficulty paying bills. 8% had food hardship, either running out of food or worrying about if they would have enough money to buy food. And lastly, 14% had to delay their medical care in the past 12 months. So based on these three key findings, we're going to make some policy recommendations. First, to promote greater equity and inclusion of Chinese Americans, we recommend incorporating Asian American history lessons across all levels of education. We also advocate for more funding for language access, especially for those with low English proficiency and more funding for community programs and organizations who bring these services and resources to the community. And lastly, we advocate for establishing clear guidelines on addressing and responding to anti-Asian hate and discrimination. The second set of recommendations is how to increase the levels of political engagement and reduce the negative impacts of the US-China relations tension. We want to advocate for increasing get out of the vote efforts and political mobilization and the grassroots level. We also want to actively discourage and speak up against the usage of inflammatory language in discussing US-China relations. And lastly, we want to promote opportunities to have meaningful conversations about political and civic engagement, not only among Chinese Americans, but also across different racial and ethnic groups. Our final set of recommendations is how to address the health and economic needs among our community. We want to encourage provision of assistance and services in different languages, including dialects, so that those with limited English proficiency can access them. We also want to facilitate discussions of these challenges so that we can dismantle this model minority stereotype. We also want to support culturally informed services and resources outreach to improve access. And lastly, we need to increase the number of bilingual, culturally competent Chinese and Asian American mental health and social work professionals. With that, I end my presentation and I welcome your feedback and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gao. Dr. Gao and members of her team, along with Committee to 100, will look to join the Q&A portion of our event. But with that foundation of information, what is disaggregated data? How do groups and organizations use data overall? How can policy be shaped by using data? To discuss this and more, allow me to introduce a panel of experts in their respective fields. Gordon H. Chang is our moderator. He's from the Olive H. Palmer Professor of Humanities and Professor of History, Stanford University. Joining Gordon is Wayne Ho, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council. Dina Jang, Policy Director for the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Rachel Marks, Chief of the Racial Statistics Branch at the U.S. Census Bureau. Roberto Ramirez, Assistant Division Chief for Special Population Statistics, also at the U.S. Census Bureau. And Dr. Neil Ruiz, Head of Research Initiatives at Pew Research Center. Professor Chang, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to Dr. Gao and her great team at Columbia for presenting uh, the summary of the survey. It's extraordinarily rich and uh, fascinating. And I know we already have a number of people who've been on the chat who've sent in questions, which we hope to get to some of them, and we'll, as many as we can later on in the question and answers. But we have a great lineup here of distinguished practitioners and policy uh, uh, advisors um, who will, will respond to the presentation. I thought the way we could proceed is to start with uh, Neil and Roberto, who are, and Rachel, who are uh, trained and experienced demographers and statisticians and survey takers, to talk about their own respective work uh, and address the question that was posed very well just now of what of, of about this aggregated data. What does that mean? And in your respective areas, uh, what what uh, does that mean to you? Uh, what has that meant for your respective organizations in your own work? And what does that mean for uh, the folks beyond your organization, for the broader public, and maybe for policy? After we hear from you, then I'd like to go to uh, Wayne in Indiana, who can speak more uh, directly 
to policy and community uh, implications uh, beyond uh, the uh, statisticians. So if that's uh, uh, okay with you folks, uh, I'll just op throw it open to Neil, Roberto, and Rachel, and uh, have you present. I'm keeping in mind that we want to have time to bring in Deanna and Wayne after your comments. So uh, would one of you like to start off? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. It's truly a pleasure to be here. Director Santos sends his regrets, was not able to make it tonight, and Rachel and I have stepped in in his place. So please uh, excuse the last uh, minute change. You know, we've been collecting, you know, Chinese American data since 1870 in our census. In fact, uh, many of you may not know that the race question is one of the oldest, one of our oldest questions that would be on our census forms. We've been collecting race since uh, 1790. And we've been collecting race data every 10 years since then. We are probably one of the leaders, I would say one of the big leaders in data disaggregation of race ethnicity data in the country. And in fact, and not only in the 2020 census, but in previous censuses, we actually have an, an actual an individual checkbox for Chinese uh, identity. In fact, we have greatly improved the data collection, not only on the Chinese population, but we also have done that for many ethnic and racial groups in the country. And not only do we, many of you are probably also familiar with a lot of the data sets that we have collected, and we have a number that will be coming out soon. In fact, Rachel or Ashley is going to talk a little bit about some of the upcoming data products that are going to come out um, in June from the American Community Survey, which is actually very impressive with the results that we just heard right now. One of the largest surveys that the Census Bureau collects is from the American Community Survey, over 3 million housing units that we sample, where we collect a lot of social economic characteristics, and not only on the American, you know, not only on the Chinese population for all ethnicities in the country. So Rachel, if you don't mind talking a little about that, and of course the upcoming 2020 census products as well. Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us tonight. And also want to congratulate you on completing that survey at the Census Bureau. We certainly know that that's not an easy feat to uh, always get a survey completed and get people to respond to your surveys. So mm -hmm. congratulations on that. Um, so as Roberta mentioned, you know, the Census Bureau, we have a long history of collecting disaggregated data and also disseminating it because we know the importance of having that disaggregated data. You know, we recognize that the Asian community is not a monolith. You know, Dr. 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 Gao mentioned that, you know, there's the model minority myth and you have to be able to see the differences within the Asian community to see what's understand what's going on in the different communities within the larger Asian population. So at the Census Bureau, we have a number of data sets coming out this year that we're really excited about where you'll be able to get data on the Chinese population. This summer in June, we have a really big data set being released from the American Community Survey. Um, it's our five year 2017 2021 special population tables. Um, and this will include data on the Chinese population as well as many other detailed groups that are disaggregated. Um, and it will have over 250 tables in this product. So there'll be data on um, housing, family type, income, um, you know, education, language, and all the data we collect on the American Community Survey will be available in this file at a variety of geographic levels for the Chinese population and also many other Asian groups, Native Hawaiian groups, um, and other groups as well. So we're excited about that. Um, we also have, um, coming up in September, a really big release from data that we collected in the 2020 census. Uh, and this product is called the Detailed Demographic and Housing Characteristics File. It's kind of a mouthful, so we call it the Detailed DHCA for short. Uh, but this is where you will be able to see what is the population count for the Chinese population in the U.S., in, the, in your state, in your community, and that file will also include age and sex statistics in that file as well. Um, so that's coming out in September. We know a lot of people are really eager for that file. Um, and finally, we have another file coming out. Um, we're still working on the release date for that, but it'll also be from the 2020 census, and it will include data on household structure, family type, um, 
and owners and renters. So data on the Chinese population will also be available in that file. So we have a lot of data about disaggregated groups, including the Chinese population that will be coming out um, you know, throughout this year and into next year. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Neil Ruiz from Pew Research Center, and um, it's been great to, to hear the results. And I think that at Pew Research Center, we have been really working on um, really data disaggregating about the Asian American community and other groups, racial and other groups in the United States. We know how hard it is, right? How do you get data that is very inclusive of the diversity of Asian American experiences? Because all Asians are not the same, right? Filipinos, Chinese, Bhutanese, Burmese, but even within each group, there are different generations. Those who arrived in the last 10 years, those who've been there more than 10 years, those who were born in the US, those who are, um, who are uh, born abroad. We have different income levels, different education. These are the challenges that we have in survey research and in general in social science research. So at Pew Research Center, we've been, I've been leading this multi-year mixed methods approach to really include as many voices from these very different diverse experiences. And over the last several years, we've used a lot of the census data to do a demographic look at the biodiversity of Asian American experiences. We did a very big qualitative um, study, 66 focus groups in 18 different of 18 different Asian origin groups in 18 different languages moderated by uh, members of the ethnic groups to really understand what Asians are telling us, what it means to be them in America. But knowing that that's still qualitative and non-probability, it gave us a great insight on the themes of, of what Asians are telling us um, they're experiencing, as well as groups that we'd never be able to use survey tools to understand a national representative sample of, for instance, for Burmese, Lao, Hmong Americans. And then upcoming, I'm so excited. Um, we're very in the, very few days, the beginning of the month of, of next May, of May, we'll be releasing the largest um, probability-based survey, national representative of its kind on Asian Americans, where we will see various different groups by origins and everything else I, I talked about in terms of the different diverse experiences. So we really aim for this diversity of experiences, trying to capture that because for Asian Americans are not all the same. And also even within the origins, we're also very different and have different experiences different starting points, different ways people have immigrated into the U.S., different experiences. But there are also things that are shared as well that survey instruments can help us understand. So um, thank you for having me. But I think that um, one thing that is key that we found, um, we're nonpartisan, non-advocacy. And in terms of using our data, we really just care of making sure that we're elevating the actual voices and understanding of the people so that policymakers, government officials, civic organizations, philanthropists, can channel their resources, their decisions, their money to the needs of what the population is telling them that they need. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Neil, Roberto, and Rachel. Those are great, concise uh, contributions to our discussion. I already see questions that are specifically directed towards each of you and your organizations about how some of the uh, folks on this uh, webinar can access the data you've mentioned. Your survey. So I'm not sure if if how that can be presented, but to expedite matters, and there's somehow or we, we can send out the links to your organizations, basically, or just right now, just go quickly and say how people can access the Census Bureau and the Pew, and then we can turn to Wayne and Deanna to go more into policy and community politics. So uh, Rachel, might you say something about access? Yeah, so the best way to access our data is by visiting our website, census.gov, and we have a lot of tools to make it easy to access our data. Um, and we also have videos, data gems, um, and if you have any difficulty at all accessing the data, you can call census and somebody will help you at all. So uh, we really want you to be able to get uh, access to that data. Also, I want to read, I also want to say real quickly that we also have a great number of reports as well, not only data tables, for example, but a number of uh, data visualizations. We actually have a lot of great articles and briefs not only describe the Chinese population socioeconomically, but also available for other Asian uh, populations as uh, 
Dr. Ruiz has mentioned as well. So that's also available on our website. And, and Pew Research Center, if you just Google Pew, what it means to be Asian in America, it'll go to the page that actually has a lot of this data, quantitative, qualitative, demographic. Um, we also have a documentary that we that was based on the 66 focus groups that we released in August, as well as other um, tools to understand all the various groups that usually are not heard in survey research. We have um, quotes from them from the focus groups as well. Excellent. Thank you. And Pew is spelled P-E-W. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Wayne and Deanna. Uh, thank you uh, for the previous speakers. And we'll turn over to, to you, uh, turn to you two, to talk uh, about your, uh, uh, who you represent and, and what kind of work you've done that, and how you respond to this uh, fascinating survey. Um, maybe I'll turn to Deanna first, uh, if I may. Uh, and Diana, might you say first who you represent? Who, what, where you're, you're there in Washington D.C. and part of the White House initiative, which is very impressive. And I think some of us know about it, but others don't. And it'd be great if you could start off that way, and then maybe respond to what you've heard. Um, sure, Gordon. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Deanna Jang, and I'm the policy director of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, or what we call WIAMPI. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the Committee of 100 and Columbia University for inviting us to be part of this important conversation. And I want to also send greetings from our Executive Director, Crystal Kai. Um, as you know, we're, we're coming into Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month, otherwise known as mayhem in our, in our world. So we've been very busy and we're actually planning a big White House forum on May 3rd, which I hope many of you will participate in. And two of my co-presenters here are going to be in a breakout session on um, data on this very issue of data equity. So I wanna thank the Census Bureau and Neil for being part of our big forum. And um, I hope you all will participate. If you're in DC, it's at the George Washington University. Um, but we also have a streaming option for the plenary session. You won't be able to tune into the data equity or other breakouts, but you can stream the plenary session, which will feature uh, cabinet officials, um, senior officials, um, and other uh, you know community and, and other leaders. Um, it was great to see Ambassador um, Locke um, at the beginning of this program. He was actually one of the co-chairs of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders during the Obama administration. Um, the initiative was first started under President Clinton and has been um, present in every administration since then in one form or another. Um, our current version, WINAPI, was established and expanded under President Biden with Executive Order 14031, sorry, too many numbers. Um, 14031, with our primary charge being to drive an ambitious whole of government agenda to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for our a a Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities. Our work takes a variety of forms from working with government agencies to meeting with community leaders. WINAPI continuously strives to make all levels of government accessible um, to Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. We have a variety of key policy objectives, which are outlined by the exec executive order that include everything from helping to coordinate COVID-19 outreach, addressing anti-A NHPI violence and hate, economic security and opportunity, promoting educational equity, and so much more. We have a multi-pronged approach to driving change and delivering results, uh, which means we see all these priority areas as really necessary for uplifting our communities. And it's truly shaped by the needs of our community. And surveys such as this one really um, reinforces that and is really helpful to our work to try to promote policy change. Um, I just want to mention some of the um, initiatives that we've taken, particularly on, on the data disaggregation. Um, good, we know good data is, is really important to um, 
to have informed, impactful, and equitable policy. And when it's disaggregated, we can unmask disparities, identify affected populations, and design effective responses to, to problems large and small. So federal data collection and reporting practices often fail to measure, reflect, and disaggregate the diversity of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander experiences. That's why examples that your survey shows, as well as the work Neil and other um, researchers on the outside have really helped, um, you know, helped us to promote these same types of practices within the federal government. Um, it's really important that data collection practices help us understand the impact also of intersecting identities of AA and NHK populations. So I was really happy to see the data about um, mental health status as well as disability and socioeconomic that was included um, in the survey. Um, we have always supported um, the expansion of data disaggregation practices that will help create better policy outcomes for our communities. So to advance those efforts, President Biden established the Equitable Data Working Group in January 2021 to study how the federal government can improve its data collection policies. On April 22nd, 2022, the group published its recommendations, including a call for federal data systems to support disaggregation while protecting privacy, allowing for deeper insight into AA and NHPI communities' unique needs. And last May, um, Wainapi, along with the White House, hosted a summit on um, data disaggregation and something we hope to continue to have every year to share the best practices and successful models of how federal agencies can better collect and report disaggregated A and NHPI data in federal surveys, reports, and research. And we're currently uh, promoting data disaggregation across federal government. We're, we're asking each agency to give us um, their plans on how they will improve the collection reporting of um, data sets that can be disaggregated and best highlight the needs of our underserved communities. Um, we've, we've continued to make progress since last May. Um, in June, the Chief Statistician of the United States announced the launch of a formal review to revise the Office of Management and Budgets Directive 15. Um, this is something that was referred to earlier. And um, in January, OMB published a notice and request for comments on their initial proposals for updating um, OMB's race and ethnicity statistical stand standards. That comment period um, closes today, and I hope many of you submitted comments. Um, at midnight, at midnight tonight. <laughs> yeah, midnight tonight. You still have time. Go, uh, have, uh, go in there and uh, submit your comments. That is true. Um, in the meantime, the chief statistician has also provided federal agencies with guidance on best practices for collecting and reporting disaggregated data, including detailed Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, ethnic, uh, race and ethnicity data. Um, I just want to give some examples of things that agencies have done. One thing is the Department of Labor. I mean, agencies have looked at the data they do have and how they can report it in the disaggregated way. So in September, 2022, the Bureau of Labor Statistics published for the first time monthly labor force estimates for Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders regarding the unemployment rate, uh, employment population rate ratio and the labor force participation rate and other key metrics. Um, we, we hope other agencies will also look at the type of, um, you know, what disaggregated data they have and also make it available to these communities. So I'm, I'm gonna end there and let Wayne speak. It's good to see him after so many years. And I hope to see him at the forum on May 3rd. Thank you, Deanna. And Wayne, uh, welcome. Uh, Wayne is, uh, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council. But Wayne, would you first start off by saying what is the Chinese American Planning Council and your role and then uh, um, engage in any way with the material that has been presented so far. Great. Uh, thank you, Gordon. Uh, good to see you. And Deanna, it's been a long time. Good to see you. I will see you next week down in D.C. Uh, so I'm Wayne Ho. I have the privilege of running the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC, 
we are the nation's largest Asian American social services organization. So our dedicated team of about 5,000 staff serve about 80,000 New Yorkers per year. And these are 80,000 New Yorkers who live across the 51 city council districts of the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, two thirds of our community members are Asian American, mostly Chinese. The other third represents the diversity of New York, so Black, Brown, and other immigrant New Yorkers. And we serve everyone from children uh, to seniors to adults to families. And this research becomes key, and we're honored, and congratulations to C100 and to Columbia University that uh, we're honored to have been one of those 100 community-based organizations that partnered with them on this data. And we know that disaggregated data becomes very important because we don't have that data often at our hands. And we know that this can help us in three areas, services, funding, and policies. So as a social services organization, every day we know the issues that go on in our community, but we oftentimes don't have the data to back it up. So too often we see community members come into our community centers and they have documents from the government, from their landlord, and they need it translated and they have no one to speak to. Too often we know that uh, while every school in New York City is supposed to offer interpretation services, that during parent-teacher conferences, kids oftentimes are interpreting for their parents, which is obviously awkward when you're talking about the child's development and academic work and the child's there translating for their parents. Uh, we know too often that seniors are trying to access meals or Medicaid or other public benefits and they come to us to make sure that we become their cultural brokers. Uh, there's too often that we hear about uh, immigrants just trying to make sure that they can enroll in classes or go vote, and they don't have those resources available. So having data at our hands becomes important then because we're not just hearing these stories and anecdotes, we are be better able to have programming that can address not just the persistent needs in our community, but these emerging trends in our community. So pulling together census data, American Community Survey data, and now the C100 Columbia University surveys becomes very important to us for better services. Secondly, to funding. Uh, the Asian American community does make up 18% of New York City. New York City has 8.6 million people. So there's a lot of Asian American New Yorkers. Uh, about 45% of all Asian Americans in New York City are Chinese. Um, while we're the fastest growing group in New York, we only we don't get a fair share of the resources. So we get less than 1.5% of all government social service contract dollars. We get less than 0.5% of all philanthropic dollars which means then that the on the ground organizations and the on the ground staff providing services or trying to empower the community or organize the community doesn't have the public or the private resources in order to do so. So having this data becomes important because the reality is the government does not respond to surveys that we do ourselves. Even though our surveys are true and we can tell the stories of what our community members are facing and the barriers that exist and what they need to be healthy, housed, educated, and fed, we need, quote unquote, objective data. And that's why having research from Columbia University and Committee 100 becomes key is because then when we're responding to government RFPs, when we're writing grant proposals, when we're meeting with legislators and government officials, we can show data on what is happening in the Chinese American community. And it's broken out uh, by different groups uh, within the Chinese diaspora. Uh, last but not least, policymaking. Uh, government officials need to know that there has to be better policies that respond to our community. And that can only be done in two ways. One is showing the needs in the community. We know there's still community safety issues. We know there's still language barriers. We know that there's still other issues in our community, and these are social issues. But we also need to make sure that elected officials respond to their constituents. And by having data here about the voting pattern or the voting rates of the Chinese American community becomes very important because too often we face the stereotype of being the perpetual foreigner. Where are you from? Where are you really from? You speak English well. 
And we need them to know that we are part of America, we're part of New York City, and we are voters. And that's when we can hold elected officials and government officials accountable to us. One simple example is last week, the city of New York launched a new portal for public benefits called My City. Uh, if you go to My City, it, everything is in English. And when we ask them if they've translated into the top two languages, which are Spanish and Chinese, the answer was no, but it, you can use the Google Translate app and uh, extension. And right away, that is not good policy. We know Google Translate is poor. So imagine trying to access public benefits, knowing whether you can get housing vouchers, knowing whether you are eligible to get food stamps, and trying to do that through a portal that uses Google Translate. It's not appropriate. And that's why we need to see better policies. Um, so thank you again for being here. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. And great to see many of you. Alice, thank you so much. Uh, really uh, important comments and helping to, helping us to concretize the implications, the importance of the kind of work that Dr. Gallum and her team have done, and also give us more insight into a way into how policy uh, and government works in the ground. Uh, we're we're really doing well on time here. We have a lot of questions uh, that have been sent in on a quick Q and A. And I want to turn to them, but I want to ask uh, Charles uh, first. Now, I see on the chat function here that there are a number of questions uh, related to uh, that that, that uh, you respond and say that you'll be responding to this question, to these questions. And I'm wondering, do you want to jump in here and take a few of them yep. before we open it up? to Dr. Gao and to the panelists. I, I have some questions. I tried to aggregate some of the questions because they're all over the map. Um, but Charles, what do you think? Indeed, we we have a lot of questions that have come in. We tried to group them, I think, into two categories. We also got questions over email as well. So we tried to group them in the categories for the at-large panel, as well as category for specifically on the survey from there as well. So uh, Gordon, I think your recommendations, sir, with the questions to ask for the panel are great. And I can start with one of the first ones I have right here, if that's okay. Yes, yeah. Please, okay, great. So with the joint study on Chinese Americans and then with leaders of other organizations on this panel who produce their own studies and data on either Chinese Americans, API, or other minority communities, now that you share your data, what are the next steps? What can this audience do with that data? And that question is for the panel. That's a big question. <laughs> That's it is a big question. A lot of us want to know, you know, what next? How can we use this information? Uh, analysts have given some good examples of how the availability of data and unavailability of data can help or sometimes ignored. But uh, what can we all do to use this evidence? We can call data as evidence to advance uh, the welfare of this community. I, I would suggest that the, the first thing is we have to use the data. I think we all know, many of us have written reports, many of us have done research or uh, policy analysis, and too often good data comes out and then ends up just sitting on the shelf. And it doesn't move decision makers, it doesn't move philanthropy, it doesn't move the general populace. So uh, I think while lots of data is important for folks like us, the reality is we need to find the most persuasive data points in this research, and we just need to keep reminding decision makers at the federal level to the states, different states, to different cities, that this is uh, the, the state of the Chinese American community, and then we need to tie the data into the work that we've been doing. Uh, I've been looking on the list of participants here, and there's a lot of allies uh, who run nonprofit organizations throughout the country. I see advocates and organizers on here. I see uh, philanthropy on here. And I think that we all need to work together to advance the work we've been doing. 
we know some states and cities, for example, have disaggregated data legislation that's passed. We know others are working on it. Let's use this information to get those through the finish line. We know California and New York, for example, has more funding to address AAPI hate and recovery. So let's tie this data into our budget advocacy efforts. And for those of us that work on the ground in the community, let's use this information when we apply for RFPs or foundation funding. Let's use this data when we are trying to mobilize our community to vote. Let's use this data when we're engaging with elected officials and holding them accountable to our community. So this is the biggest research of its kind for the Chinese American community. So it's our responsibility, the nearly 600 people on here, to make sure that we use this data well for our efforts. I like to I like to follow up with Wayne's comments. Um, you know, the Census Bureau, you know, we're a statistical agency. And so our job really is to provide, you know, data, demographic data, not only in the Chinese population, but on all racial and ethnic, ethnic communities in the country. But, you know, our data coupled with the survey that was just presented and other research that's presented could be used for those agencies that are engaged in policy, for example. So as Wayne said, you know, tying the data together, right? Official statistics, for example, from the Census Bureau, you know, the two census data products that um, Rachel mentioned earlier coming out from the American Community Survey and from the 2020 census, you know, could be coupled and tied with the survey findings um, that Dr. Chow had mentioned and course findings and others that uh, Neil and Wayne are talking about. So, you know, this is the reason why we're here, you know, is just to kind of say, hey, we're collecting this data as a statistical agency, although we don't engage in policy, there are definitely other federal agencies, state agencies that also engage in policy, and, and we're here to inform that. Yeah, I was going to say your survey was a perfect example because I love Dr. Gao, how at the end you had those recommendations. So that's the sort of model that I think people should be following because you got this rich information from your survey and then you had recommendations. I mean, my ears perked up because we're planning a Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander mental health summit. And so just having that information and you had that recommendation, we need more bilingual, you know, uh, culturally competent mental health professionals. That data really helps support that. And I totally agree with Wayne. I mean, the data drives where resources go. Uh, we need it to, the community needs it to evaluate their own programs and its effectiveness. Um, I'm a civil rights attorney, so it's needed for compliance. And, you know, Wayne knows my ears perked up when he told me that their, their new port, uh, public benefits portal was like an English only. Um, you know, that happened with COVID. You know, it, we, we thought that Asians, were not as affected by COVID as you know other minority groups, but then we had heard stories about how the access to information about testing and screening um, were not in different languages, and that people were um, being turned away or not getting the information. So this that we really have to link the data to the policy recommendation that we're trying to achieve. Thank you, uh, Charles. If I may, I don't jump back in here uh, and pose a question. Now we have uh, Dr. Gao back with us, and then we'll go back to the rest of the panelists, but I think it's important uh, to address a couple of the questions that have uh, been in, addressed about the survey specifically. And I see a few of these, the couple of questions that I see are these, and Professor, perhaps Dr. Gao can respond and her team. One sort of basic question, how representative is the survey? And you did, you did a great job in talking about weighting the, the responses. Uh, but you might explain a bit more and just address this issue about representativeness. The second is, how did the survey define Chinese Americans? These are all kind of very basic questions which have come in, and they're excellent. Uh, and lastly, um, but not least, and there are other great questions, how do people access the data? So would you mind then responding? Of course, thank you so much. And I loved hearing all the different panelists sharing their, what they are doing, what's coming up. It's a, a very exciting time. And the way your organization was the 
among the very first to collaborate with us. So thank you very much. And we are eager to share the data with you as well to, to tell these stories. Um, so about the sample representatives, thank you, uh, the representativeness, thank you very much for that question. As I said, we didn't use a probability sampling method. What we used was with a plan to reach very diverse population groups within the Chinese Americans. So I listed, I think seven or eight demographic variables. We really um, wanted to weigh the data on with actually the Census uh, Bureau's American Community Survey data. So after the weights are applied, our sample distribution are the same as the uh, Chinese American population in the American Community Survey in those key demographic variables. After the, mag uh, after the weighting and when they are matched, we did some benchmarking on other additional variables. They're not exactly the same, but they are very similar. So on that, we feel comfortable that our sample really reflects diversity of the Chinese American population. But because of our sample design, we cannot claim it's nationally representative. Uh, we are very proud. Uh, we designed a recruitment strategy that we monitored who are report responding to our survey weekly. And then we identify where we need more people to be represented, for example, at the initial stage, we saw that young people were not responding at a reasonably high uh, rate. So we really pushed to reach out to the younger groups. Now we found that in the South, we don't have a lot of respondents. So we really reached out to those regions. So we did a very targeted weekly monitoring and then targeted uh, recruitment strategy. And then coupled with the statistical weighting, we feel that we do capture the very diverse, uh, both demographic, but also socioeconomic uh, different subgroups within our population. Um, how do we identify people uh, who are of Chinese descent or we consider as Chinese Americans? So in our study, we have three inclusion criteria. First, uh, these have to be adults, 18 or older. Second, they self-identify as Chinese American of Chinese descent or of Chinese ethnic origin. We don't define it for them. Um, if they are of mixed race, but they consider themselves as of Chinese descent, that's totally fine. So we have a variety of different origins or family compositions. Actually, we have data to look at. And lastly, we ask the respondents to be currently living in the US when they were responding to the survey. So these are the three criteria, but we don't define who are Chinese Americans. People define it themselves. Uh, lastly, how to share the data. We just produced these results brand new. My team has been working nonstop. I'm so grateful to all of them. Uh, we are going to do more analysis as the previous question uh, mentioned. We want to tell a more nuanced story of this large and rapidly growing population. We want to showcase what we call the intersectionality. So already we discovered that people of lower income actually suffer more from the health disadvantages. No surprise, but our data can show that, right? So we are want to delve deeper into our data and to, to tell more of those dynamic and nuanced stories. And when we have the data really ready and clean the crafted, we can share with the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gao. Um, Charles, do you have a, you would like to jump back in or I have another, I have some other questions, but uh, I-, I Gordon, to... the floor is yours, sir. Right. So maybe I just, if I may, I have one follow-up question with Dr. Gao, and it's sort of my big obvious one. What's most surprised you after conducting the survey, you, you're, you're a scholar, a specialist in this, you've been working on this, you know the Chinese American community very well. But what were the, a couple of the, the big surprises to you, if there were any? Uh, I, I, I have some thoughts, but I wanna hear from you as a specialist. I really want to hear your thoughts because you know this very well and you know the history much better than I do. Do you want to go first? Then I can share mine. <laughs> well, I, I think some of the uh, audience have, have highlighted some things. One, 
very quickly, and so I don't want to dominate here or take too much time. One is is what you've pointed out, amazing, quite striking diversity. And we've really, you know, you, you've given the evidence, but language, linguistic, socioeconomic, public assistance, education, we've, but we've sort of known all this, but this has really given weight to that, those, those sentiments. Uh, the, uh, perhaps the most important to me was that almost 75% of the respondents, three out of four, reported on feeling insecurity or, or, or victims of hate and prejudice uh, and, and, and that. And that, that's, uh, that's self-reporting. These are not police reports, but this is very telling, I think, about the, this, the, the, well, the emotional well-being uh, of, of, of the community. And that, to, to me, is, is quite uh, important. Uh, and uh, the other, which somebody did mention in the, uh, uh, the question and answers, is a very interesting pattern. Now, the more in education the survey uh, respondents have, the more worried they are about U.S.-China relations. And conversely, the less education, there's less concern. Uh, and someone wants to ask, how do we explain that? So. Th those are those are three things that stand out to me. Those are excellent points. I fully agree with you. So one of my uh, key hypotheses to before Dalvi starting this project was the diversity. I thought this population is very diverse, and the results still surprised me. We are so diverse, right? In terms of place of birth, place of upbringing, language and all these socioeconomic and political views, all these dimensions. So we are diverse and nobody can take us for granted for anything, including uh, political partisan uh, voting patterns, right? So they have to take us, take us for who we are and treat us with the um, willingness to learn from us and understand us. So I think that's important. Um, secondly, I knew, uh, recent years, uh, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans are very active political participants. Still, I was surprised that our participation rate was so high. So that mm -hmm. is very inspiring to me. And I think as Wayne was saying earlier, and uh, Diana too, we need our voices to be heard and not only uh, in other domains, but in politics and in action. So I, I fully agree with you. And lastly, um, just the last section about the challenges and disadvantages and hardships. Uh, that's my specialty area. I study poverty and inequality. Still, the different dimensions of challenges faced by our community members surprised me and really was eye-opening and uh, sobering for me. So we need so much more language access. We need services. We need professionals who uh, can provide those capable and competent services. So we will do more analysis and to showcase those findings, but um, very sobering and a lot of um, efforts needed. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gop. Very, very helpful. Uh, here's a, a couple of questions to throw out to everybody. Um, and this sort of expands out uh, the, the context here. And, and some of the questions have come in Post is quite uh, uh, thoughtfully. You know, what, what there's a comparative dimension, uh, which we haven't directly addressed. It's sort of implicit in some of the responses, and and I invite all all the panelists to respond if they can uh, about the comparative. That is, with other communities, you know, within and without the Asian American uh, AAPI rubric, or with, within the Hilge family of those who. We consider to be part of the country, uh, and, and and nationally, uh, how, can you say something about how some or much much of this this, this information uh, leads us to to think about the country in, in a comparative dimension? Uh, not not to say you know to try to make a, a strict comparison about welfare or how people are feeling, but I, I think it's I think it's sort of the data sort of begs the question. Of, of how 
what is the situation of Chinese Americans in economic terms, social terms, mental health terms, compared to the general population uh, and to uh, other communities? So I welcome any, any responses. <clears throat> Neil. Um, yeah, one thing that I think this uh, speaks to is that we did something in 2018 where we actually used the census data and the CPS as well as uh, various data sources to show um, uh, between all the, just comparing to other racial and ethnic groups, Asians in the US have the highest income inequality of any other race and in, in income. So just to give you an example, the top 10 percentile of Asians um, earn 10, more than 10 times more than those who are in the bottom 10%. So there is this inequality where you do have a lot of wealth that's up at the top, but also there's people, a lot of Asian Americans in general at the bottom. And over time, since the 70s, it hasn't really changed much in terms of moving up at the bottom. So I think that that is one thing to go under, there's an understanding here of trying try to get a glimpse of what's going on there. I think that that's what's going on overall for Asian Americans. But then there is a comparative element. We did speak with, um, well, it's upcoming, <laughs> so uh, stay tuned. We'll have it um, that comparison with other origin groups and overall in the coming days. But I think that um, our focus groups really did show that. In doing, talking to 18 different Asian origin groups, we did see diversity with those who were born abroad had very different distinct experiences than those who were US born, right? For instance, in terms of identity, English language is a big, right? For those who are born abroad or recent immigrants, language is a very big issue and everything about economic mobility and how do you navigate being in America. Whereas those who are US born, it was more about identity and how do you deal and navigate your parents' heritage and also trying to fit in and be American. That's what we heard. So there's this comparative element that I know was in our Chinese American focus groups as well as all the other um, um, origin groups as well, the commonality by nativity, and there are some differences by um, the, by nativity as well. I could just tell you real quickly, just uh, from the Census Bureau's perspective, you know, the Chinese population being the largest Asian population, you know, numbering over 5 million, representing 20, you know, a quarter of the total Asian population, you know, we pay attention to this population. In fact, it's already here uh, about the lack of translation in New York, but you know we have a long history of translating our census forms in Mandarin, for example, and actually in many other languages, over sixty languages or more. Probably, so it's something that we definitely pay attention to. Pay attention to um, not only in the last census that we did in 2020 census, but for future censuses as well. So we're always, um, as you know, Rachel has mentioned always uh you know providing data particularly not only for the Chinese population for but all Asian populations in that matter I would just add quickly we were just reviewing some results not from this data set but from a different data source uh in New York uh comparing different racial groups and unfortunately the Asian American group has the highest vigilance still mm. uh, this year. Uh, some people think the pandemic is gone, anti-Asian hate is gone, it's not. So Asians are more worried about safety. They have to figure out ways to stay safe. So they actually change their travel routes or work schedule and avoid certain situations a lot more than other racial groups. Again, very unfortunate, but we need to document those and share those so that they are, they are known to the policymakers and to the world that action needs to be taken. I go back to the observation uh, of your three quarters, 75% felt uh, insecure. And uh, we don't have a comparable survey of other communities nationally or among ethnic groups. But uh, that really strikes me as important, noteworthy. Um, and I wonder how that can be used. How can that be presented? In what ways can that be presented to policymakers, even at the local level? I mean, the, the, the example Wayne gave about New York, your New York, or whatever it's called, and being uh, sort of terrible in, in uh, its blinders of how they can make this 
service, supposedly service to all New Yorkers available, it's just it makes it go down. I mean, telling people who may not have a facility with English language to go use Google Translate, it's, it's ridiculous. But uh, you know, what other ways can this information, maybe Deanna or Wayne or others, uh, uh, Rachel can, can speak to how data can be presented to uh, community organ. It's not, it's to the high level policymakers in Washington, DC, local policymakers, but also community organizations. How can this data be made actionable if we can use that word? Yeah, I mean, we're trying to really emphasize the federal agencies, the community engagement aspect. And we also have a regional network. You don't have to be in Washington, DC to affect policy. I mean, Wayne's a really great example of how you can affect policy on the local level and also involve you know federal federal people and you have great champions in Congress as, as well. Don't ignore them. You have Grace Meng in, in New York and you have Judy Chu in California. Um, getting the getting policymakers out to the communities to actually hear the stories dir directly from them is actually the most impactful. It's great to have the data to back it up. But you know, I, I like Neil's focus groups, the, the qualitative uh, part that helps tell the stories. Um, you know, I, I think we can't just have numbers without the people and the stories. Um, and so I think part of the role of the initiative is to really make that part of our you know, way of doing business is engaging communities in developing policies. Yeah, if I can add quickly, I think that one way to move policymakers is with data. The other piece of it is really with numbers. And we need to see more solidarity in the API community and the Chinese American community. Uh, you know, a lot of us have seen stats around the growth of Asian Americans who are now voting for Republicans. We've seen uh, some stats around Asian Americans uh, who are buying into more conservative policies regardless of the party that they're affiliated with. And I want to be clear, I'm not trying to get partisan here as much as I'm trying to say that we need to get on the same page as a community, as a Chinese American community, as the ANH uh, PI community. We, uh, those of us, whether we're educators, researchers, nonprofit leaders, community leaders, elected officials, we all need to do a better job of an on the ground game of working directly with community members themselves, whether they've been here for five generations or been here for five months, we need a better ground game to make sure we're all on the same page, because having solidarity, having an educated and more importantly, an empowered group of Chinese Americans is the only way that we can hold not just API elected officials, but all elected officials accountable to our community. Just earlier today, we had our six advocacy day, city advocacy day for CPC and we brought out 500 staff and community members met with half the city council in order to put our prior push our priorities and we did so because we spent a lot of time over the last six seven years educating our staff and community members about why we're fighting for certain policy and budget priorities well with that I think I really want to thank our panelists for engaging with the survey and Dr. Gao and get engaging with our attendees who uh, sent in uh, so, so many interesting ideas and questions. We've only answered a few of them. I just want to end, before I turn it over back to the C100, is to say data collection and the work that you all have done is part only part of the effort that we all need to make. We, we are all getting, this is one form of information, of evidence that we need to present to policymakers and to inform ourselves. But we were always wondering about what can we do to make things better, to stop hate. And uh, as others have pointed out in the chat, very rightfully so, that there are so many other dimensions, and that's this is true. There's spiritual dimensions, there's the cultural and arts dimensions, uh, there's the act political activism. And uh, so this uh, this is this survey is certainly no way says that this is the only way or the, even the main way of going about to affect social change. And, and I really want to thank the attendees for contributing their thoughts and, and, and helping us think through uh, this big challenge. So with that, uh, C100, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Gordon, and thank you to a fascinating panel and discussion from there as well. Now I turn the event back over to Committee 100's president for some brief closing remarks. Z, the floor is yours. 
Thank you for attending today's State of Chinese American Survey unveiling. A special thank you to our partners at Columbia University, especially Dr. Ching Gao, Jennifer So, and Stacy Tao, and on the committee of 100 staff, Sam Colvin. Your collective hard work over the past year will benefit the Chinese American community for years to come. Thank you to our honored guests for taking their valuable time and sharing their thoughts and perspectives on how we can take this data and make it actionable. Depending on where in the world you are, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you all for joining our event. If you have any further questions, please send them to info at committeeof100.org and they will be routed accordingly. Have a wonderful day or evening, wherever your journey takes you today. Good night.